thank you all for coming. This is our second uh, viewing party of the semester. So I see some familiar faces. I'm recognizing some of you. Not really, because my eyes are actually pretty bad. But uh, I, know who's, I know who some of you are. Uh, so thank you for coming. Uh, this time around, I actually do have a bit of a plan. Uh, we have instructors coming. Uh, Mac, our club's uh, Tai Chi instructor, our Chinese style Tai Chi instructor is here. Oh, sure, you can applaud for that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, Mr. Gong told me last night that he was planning to come by, and uh, so when he comes by, we'll just roll with it, all right? So first off, uh, we wanted to be able to have a short exposition about uh, the other practices that our Wushu Club offers. Uh, so right now we have Mac here. Uh, Mac, do you have any videos that you'd like to start with first? Or just no, just wanna... yeah. All right, okay. Uh, so again, Mac Kolstock is uh, right now the uh, our club instructor for Chen style Tai Chi. Uh, it's the traditional uh, style of Tai Chi training, the actual martial art. It's the oldest form of Tai Chi training that we know today. And uh, I'll just let Mac uh, take it from there. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, other than people I've seen, who has done Tai Chi in the past? So, does anybody know anything about Tai Chi? Other than <laughs> other than guys I've um, well, probably seen old people do it in the park, waving their hands around really slow. Um, as Matt's done a presumably fairly good job doing over the past several years that I've been the coach, Tai Chi is fundamentally a martial art, and it has health benefit aspects to it, certainly. Not unlike Wushu, although it's not as extreme on the joints as Wushu tends to be, so that's why old people do it. Um, but if you start Tai Chi young, you usually get more out of it than if you start when you're 60. You might. You guys are college kids, so I can say that because nobody here is over the age of like 20. <laughs> so, the, um, I'm not really sure where to even start with Tai Chi. There's uh, a lot that can be said about it, not unlike any other traditional form of martial arts that any of you could possibly learn. The way that I teach it here at the club is I focus on fundamentals and principles of Tai Chi rather than specific movements because you can learn moves, you can learn forms. If you have any understanding of how your body works, you can pick up any form you want pretty much off the internet these days. So the forms are not as important. Application is important. The application doesn't make sense without the principle. So for Tai Chi's sake, and you'll find that these principles that you learn from Tai Chi are applicable in some extent in modern Wushu, certainly in any other traditional form that you learn, whether it's Baji, Kira Mr. Gung, uh, the other stuff that he teaches, as well as if you leave UMBC and find another teacher, it'll all be worth the while there too. Um, so, uh, check out the class, I guess. I can give a short demonstration, I can give a couple application ideas, but. I mean, there's only so much you can get out of the talk in my opinion, so. Who wants, this is your, this is your guy's session, man. What do, you, what do you guys want to see? You want to see me throw him around? Yes. 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 <laughs> oh, oh, I see how it is. Fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Towards the food, sure. Yeah, towards the food. That way they suffer too. Okay. Hey now, <laughs> better your body block now. Hey, you want you want to see me get screwed? I'm taking something from you. <laughs> <laughs> so for uh, one of the things that you often hear taught in Tai Chi is how to push, and you know normally it's not how to uh, push a car or how to push like drywall. Although that's certainly helpful. Because we already know how to push these things. We already know how to take a heavy object and roll it across the room with our bodies as hard as we can. IG pushing is something a little bit more than just, you know, using muscles you would use to lift something heavy. So, you know, if I'm, if he's uh, just being a belligerent person and trying to push me out of the way, and I'm just sort of like resisting him and then you know, like, oh, I know. I use my arm to push back, you know, it's like, okay, we can get somewhere, I guess, but it's not really helpful much. But if he's just still being a belligerent person, okay, that worked too. <laughs> <laughs> then 
idea is, you know, if you're just trying to push with your arms and push, like, you know, it's, it can help, but I'm using, I feel like I'm using too much force here. Because he's roughly my height, I shouldn't have to really push to push him out of the way. That's too much work. If you want to do that, that's great. If I wanted to do that, I would lift far more than I do at the gym, so I could be stronger, and I wouldn't have to take as much. If I'm just pushing here, <laughs> you wanted to see it. It's just, it's, that's what Tai Chi is supposed to help train: is finding structure, finding how to relax, and how to move through that structure. So I'm not just pushing with my arms and through my shoulders to do it. I'm just settling in into posture. Structure is a word you're going to hear like three thousand times if you go to Tai Chi. Yes. It's, the predominant method I use to, to teach it. Because without structure, you don't have anything. Without structure, you don't have defense. Without structure, you don't have offense. You can have it, but it won't be optimal. And it's going to be a lot of trial and error as you get hit. You know, not in my class, but if you guys take Sonda, you'll get hit a lot. And I hope you guys get hit a lot in Sonda. Because you learn better that way. Don't worry, you only get hit uh, by when Jason. you want to. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> oh. Um, Sparring is optional, but you do learn the fighting techniques and the application, so that's something that uh, Mac really uh, values, so it's something to look forward to if you're interested in that. Martial arts is nothing if it's not applied. If you can't apply it, then learn dance. Because, well, I don't mean that disparately, because you learn a lot in dance. You learn body mechanics, you learn position in space, balance, etc. You learn all these things from martial arts too, but martial arts, it offers you so much more that it's uh, more beneficial. So, um, I can give a short demonstration unless you want to see specific applications and stuff, but it won't make a difference unless you know what the, unless you know the ask how the application on has. On what? I think it's on here. You can bounce from her. Bomb. Well, we can look at it also. Do any of you have interest in Sanda or just fight technique and how Taiji plays a role in that. Well, one of the first things you'll ever learn in any Taiji class, whether it's mine or hopefully any other class you go to, if it's the introductory lesson and they don't cover this, find another instructor because they're on sketchy ground. And that'll be this, your tree hugging posture. I call it standing post. That's usually what it's called. Round shape here, pelvis tucked, knees bent, relax. So, why do you train this? Training functional networks to be redistributing force, training roundness, Taiji is all about roundness. Why is Taiji about roundness? Easy things to consider just even in day one in your sparring, if you spar at Usanda. So, actually, Matt, When I usually, when I used to spar more often, I would always have my hand relatively in this shape. Same round posture. Not too far in, certainly not too far out. And I never fought like this because it doesn't, it's good for getting out of the situation. It's not good for entering one. If you're in this type of posture here, he doesn't have too many avenues in because no matter where you are, you just, you know, raise an elbow, drop an elbow. You have this space to work with. If you lose this space, now you have avenues that he can come in with. He has avenues straight into your core. If he has avenues into your core, he can move you around anywhere he wants you. Keep distance from your core, keep space, keep posture, keep structure. It all works out. So, um, like I said, not much I can really cover in too much space. So, I uh, obviously prepared a very thorough speech for you. So. Um, I can do a brief demonstration of some stuff you might get out of it for like form work. I usually only teach a 5 to 18 posture form for the semester because, like I said, my emphasis is not on form work. I find it valuable to teach form and teach posture and specific technique because it is, you know, I'm using Chen to do this. But, you know, if, if you, all you wanted was form, just go to YouTube because it's easier on me and it's easier on you guys. You don't have to listen to me talk and, and the 
throwing it around and stuff. So, all right. So I'll just demonstrate something cool and uh, I'll do that. Um, what I'm going to demonstrate is called, uh, well, it's a new frame routine that I put together. And what I teach as a guideline in class is called old frame. Old frame Chen, huge circles, movements, usually deeper stances, it doesn't matter too much in that regard for the way I approach it. You practice larger movements in Tai Chi in order to understand smaller motions in Tai Chi. The better you get at the larger motions, the easier it will be to understand the smaller motions. For Tai Chi of large circles, every, every movement comes out of some sort of large circle here. It doesn't matter where you're going. Your blows, your strikes, those come out of tangents off of these circles. Generate power here and come out. So if you have some sort of uh, easiest intuitive uh, application for something like that, it is just coming out of like blocks and punches into something a little bit more. Um, do that again. Here. One, two, coming up in and then out. Shrinking the circle into a tangent. That doesn't make sense now. It makes sense. So, new frame focuses on smaller circles. Sound is a little larger circles too. Smaller circles usually for getting out of joint locks, inflicting joint locks, as well as shrinking your power down into being optimal in shorter distances. If I have this much space to throw a punch, then I can throw a pretty good punch, especially off the back. If I have this much space to throw a punch, most people, including myself, will have a much harder time generating any kind of power from here. But if you have an understanding of how the body mechanics work, then it becomes easier to throw that kind of punch. You know, that kind of power works, but if you're here, you, you know, it's just a quick, quick response. So, um, yeah, I'll demonstrate something.
have any questions. I have a question. So you say you teach textile, right? How exactly makes that different from another style of textile? I'm glad you asked. I would have said that to any question that anybody asked. <laughs> Chen was, as far as we understand, the first style of Taiji developed. Um, back when it was developed, they didn't call it Taiji, they just called it Chen Family Boxing. And Chen Village had a history of martial arts long before the first person credited with being the Chen style was around. Uh, Chen Fontaine, I believe, yeah. Um, there are alternate theories of where it came from. Wudong Mountain is usually where the other people say it came from, and uh, developed by a man by the name of Zhang Senfang, wandering Taoist monk who became one of the Taoist immortals, I believe. Uh, his authenticity is debated. You know, some people question whether he existed. He apparently developed Taiji after watching a snake fight a crane on the side of a mountain. And most went on monks can point to the exact rock in which he saw this. However, nobody really has any documentation beside oral tradition. And uh, it's kind of whatever, I don't really pay any mind. Um, some years, about a couple hundred years after Chen Wang Ting lived, he was supposed to develop Chen style. A man by the name of Yang Lushan came around. He spied on them because he was curious. He got found out, he got formally trained. Um, and then when he left the village and taught, his style of Taiji became Yang style Taiji. That is the most popular one around the world. There are various forms of it, various styles of, like sub-styles of Yang Taiji. Doesn't really matter for our purposes. Chen style Taiji, the reason it looks the way it looks today is because, uh, it's hard to say. Um, Yang style has simplified some of its movements for the popular audience. For the classical Yang styles that still are still around, they have emphasized certain aspects. Um, a lot of it comes down to style differences simply changing over time. I mean, if you find a Seven Star Mantis guy, his Seven Star Mantis is going to be different from you know his master's 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 Seven Star Seven Star Mantis style, just because body frames change. You know, the people you're teaching it to, maybe you don't want them to learn everything about. Maybe you do. Maybe they just do it differently because they have different interpretations. Um, in some cases, they just they already come from various backgrounds of knowledge, and they change it to their own, own unique tastes. For a Chen style, a lot of these motions here come down to basic practice. The, the Chen family has found ways of synthesizing the most important aspects of what they believe Tai Chi is about, and it comes down to predominantly understanding how these you know lateral and vertical circles work in front of the body, and also these circles here. Horizontal circles, they don't mess with as much because they view them as being um, side uh, byproducts of how this motion here with the body works. Yang style, you see much more understanding of how this sort of plane works, understanding this circle here. So, so same, true, same is true with other various styles of Taiji. I'm not a I'm not a high enough practitioner yet to really tell them, oh hey, you just did it wrong and you've been misinterpreting this for hundreds of years because that's arrogant and also they know what they're doing. I mean, they can push hands incredibly well, throw people across the room at sufficiently advanced levels. So clearly they understand it. It's just how they understand it is a little different. That probably doesn't answer your question very well. But yeah. Um, I did, actually. I started with the Northern Shaolin stuff, um, because, you know, as a kid, Taiji is incredibly boring, so you don't ever want to get anymore because it's forced on you. Um, but Northern Shaolin is like, it's got jumps, it's got kicks, it's fast-paced. 
and I did that for about 10 years, and I still do that, actually, but I find Chen and Taiji in general to be, gives you more to think about, because you can do the same form over and over and over, but it can always be better. Not just better like in, in modern wushu, you get to a point where better just means you just jump higher, or you just spin faster, or you just kick harder, you know? But in Taiji, better means it, this motion can be smaller, no matter what motion it is. If I'm doing just, you know, one, two, three, four, you know, that motion can always be smaller. The circles can be always more or less perceptible than they are right now. And how do you take a circle, how do you take any kind of motion and make it so small that another person can't see what you're doing effectively, and yet still make it effective if it has to be applied? And that's why I like Tai Chi's, because that process is never ending. It can always be more subtle. Now you mentioned pushing hands. Mm. I was wondering if you could explain that. Uh, so basic combat theory, no matter what style you learn, it has effective ranges. You know, if you're learning, um, well, I've, I've only learned Northern Shaolin other than my Taiji background. In Northern Shaolin, effective ranges comes from basically being, uh, you know, this far away from someone, or actually, you know, within kicking distance of someone, to being grappling with them here. Taiji's effective range is only on contact. They do not have any kind of drills for like punching straight punches or kicks or anything like that that you would normally find in other external styles. You know, for instance, when I learned Shaolin, Northern Shaolin stuff, we had tons of line drills we would do, just basic kick, punch, kick, punch, whatever. Taiji, however, only begins on contact. You know, if you're, we've already engaged somehow here, or if we're, if he's in the middle of a, a punch or a grapple, and I'm here, this is where Taiji's effective range is. Not here, not even here about to make contact, it's already on contact. Pushing hands is training the fight theory behind that kind of concept. And the theory, the, the idea is that on contact, a sufficiently advanced practitioner of Taiji will already know where somebody is in space, you know. Not just by looking at it, because that's kind of obvious, but the eyes, you know, as any magician will tell you, the eyes don't necessarily work as well as the hands do. So in this case, if I'm here, I should already have a general idea of where his balance is, where his ground is, where his center is. And if I know where his center is, I can throw him. I can you know, manipulate his body in a way that puts him at a disadvantage. That's the point. So for pushing hands, it's a general training tool. So, um, you can actually just do like the, the train or the moving step. Usually a three or two or three different styles of pushing hands. Stationary, which is where you usually start, and that's your feet can't move, and then everything else is pretty much permitted. You know, no strikes, obviously, because that's sparring territory. Um, no joint locks, within reason, because duh. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, you know, no kicking, spinning, biting, you know, et cetera. Your second level, depending on your instructor, I don't personally like this, and I don't usually train it, but your second level after stationary step is sort of limited step, where you can only move forward and backward. We see this a lot of competitions. And in competitions, like any kind of sparring version, it's, it has its own sort of rules that are not arbitrary because they need to score points, but at the same time, if you're trained in competition, you're missing a lot of other stuff important to your training. And then the third step, which is the one I prefer the most because you have a lot of flexibility here, is a limited moving step. If you see the competition, the rings will usually be set up kind of like sumo wrestling rings. We have a, a circle, and then the idea is you can push them over or push them out of the ring, it's for a point. The way I train it, just stay in the circle and understand how to move. So uh, we don't have a kind of a, a setup here, but uh, a basic idea just to give you a, a glimpse of what moving step push hands would look like between two people that have done it before is uh, what we're going to do now. So of course, like anything else, or well, like any other form of practicing Taiji, you always want to maintain contact. 
This isn't an arbitrary rule of, oh, I'll just follow the rules. This is because if I know where, if I maintain a contact, I know where he is. You know, I don't have to look at him to know where he is. Now, hopefully, I have contact on both hands. Because if I know where this hand is, I don't know where that, where that hand is. I could be here and then right. Or even worse, if it's actually training for a real life scenario, I could be here trying to initiate something and then that hand comes over and you know, hits me somehow or tries to throw me. So I want both of my hands, preferably on both of his arms. And as like anything else, if I'm here, you know, okay, I got him, I got him, but I don't really know what I'm doing. If I'm here, now he can't do much, especially if I hit him. So, uh, that was needless exposition. So, it's uh, just a couple minutes, a couple seconds. Of that. It doesn't look like much. It doesn't look like much. It's not glamorous. You know, it's not like fighting. The real gain of it is actually feeling what it feels like. Is, is, I guess the point. High G is not as much as it can look pretty. It's really not pretty. You know, modern Wushu is pretty. It looks really cool. <laughs> high G doesn't usually look really cool. So it's kind of thankless to do. But if you do it. The, the joy is in doing it. it. That's how it feels great. And if you feel someone who's really good that can throw you across the room, and every time they do it, you still have no idea how they're doing it. Because every time they start to push and start to throw, you're like, oh, I got this. And I still got this. And oh god, what happened? <laughs> that's what it's like to push against someone that's really good. Um, I'm not really good. So that's just how it is. No. <laughs> There's that. Okay, any questions? Um, so, um, okay, for push hands, um, would you, like, what would you say is like a big difference between like, I guess, high G's push hands and like something like more like combat, like bridge hands? Like, what, do you, what would you say is like a difference? Like, what do you guys think? The difference, but like, like that sensitivity train, like, do you, like, what's the difference between kind of like that and those stuff? I have no idea what bridge hands is. I'm sorry. Uh, is it like sticky hands? Kind of. Um, so in southern styles, uh, I don't know. If, you do Java, don't you? So yeah. Java. I don't know. Does Java have sensitivity to bridge hands? We do. My master in particular likes to kind of actually teach you a little bit of um, Yang Sao Tai Chi and okay. like push hands. All right. He does that personally, though, like most um, other schools do. Well, the thing about pushing hands, and maybe this will answer the question, but maybe not. Pushing hands is, you know, when, when you saw he and I doing it, um, we were doing it awfully because both of us had too much tension. You know, pushing hands is not fundamentally a wrestling match. It should be about understanding sensitivity and training sensitivity, a sense of like, okay, if, if he's pushing against me, really pushing against me. It's like, all right, how do I, what do I do here? And if I'm trying to push back, well, okay, I can, I can do that to him. I can't do that to Andrew because he's bigger, he's stronger. Mm -hmm. So if he's pushing here, what do I, you know, okay. The moment I start to feel that, that push being more than just like a, a nudge, if he's actually really pushing, I can sense that, now it's like, okay, 
how do I get out of that? And the reason you trade it that way is so you can feel the difference between, okay, this test in the water, test in the water, and now you're an actual push. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine that bridging hands probably does the same thing. I would assume. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah bridge hands is actually uh, essentially the same idea as uh, Seijo or push hands in uh, Tai Chi because it's a sensitivity drill. Uh, so like in bridge hands, I'm not I'm not good at doing it because I've never done it before. But it's like this kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Where they go like this, and then let's say he knows where I am. Why? Because he's touching me. Right. He can feel my force, right? He knows what I'm doing. He doesn't even have to look at me. Right? right? Let's say I go like this. This is open right away. Oh, 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 right? Now, the same exact thing in Wing Chun, right? Yeah, you know, they do this oh, stuff, it's called sticky hands, qi sao, shi shou, in Mandarin, right? Yeah. It's called qi sao in Cantonese, right? Same exact thing. Except in this range, Wing Chun teaches trapping, right? You know, this, this kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna do it because I don't know Wing Chun. But, <laughs> but uh, push hands is more in this range, right? More like wrestling. They don't train strikes, okay? Right. That's their method. Okay. Same idea, different method. Okay, I see. I always like watching it because it shows how well the concepts translate, and I like watching that the most out of all the traditional Chinese martial arts. Now there is one thing I should actually point out since you brought up the striking issue, is because uh, my background is actually in something predominantly taught with striking. I use Ten Tai Chi, and I usually teach Ten Tai Chi not within one specific mode. A lot of Chen stylists will, you know, if you ever see uh, videos of uh, actually favorite Chen Chong. Yeah. Yeah. Chiang, he's a wonderful example. You can watch the video from afterwards. Yeah, you should. Um, he's uh, amazing. And if you ever meet him, he's really cool, too. But he, you know, he, he'll just throw you, and you won't know how. And usually when he throws you, he's not throwing you up. He's like slamming you to the ground. Because that's just him. Yeah. Um, most Chen stylists that take this into the ring, or take this beyond just doing forms and looking cool, use it to wrestle. And predominantly use it as, as you know, fast wrestling of you know, uh, Shui Jiao aspects. Um, so, with that in mind, I don't usually go that route, even though that is Chen's specialty, more or less, usually considered that. I look at Chen style Tai Chi, and Tai Chi in general, as being a method to put somebody in a bad position to be in. Because my first mode of thinking is how do I hit them, where do I hit them, and how do I hit them as hard as I possibly can, where it will hurt the most. So, when you have aspects of like, uh, there's certain moves in the form. Um, I was actually, the, the, the second or third move that I did today of one, two, three, and then coming out here, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't look like there are obvious strikes here. There are potentials for avenues for that. If you have some kind of, you have a, a, a specific one, two, of an arm bar here, okay, well that works, that's obvious. Come in, elbow under the arm. Cluster of nerves, this is gonna hurt like hell if you hit them hard. And if you're coming in fast, boom, and then throw. Oh, that it's that kind of thing, where, yes, that is a specific aspect of it, but at the same time, I don't usually focus on how do I throw them, or what do I do with them, how do I put them in a position that is most advantageous to them. Yeah, uh, that's basically it. Any other questions? Cool. All right, yeah, let's like. Uh, let's actually check out, uh, I don't know if you guys saw this video last time, uh, you probably did. In fact, I think I do remember sharing this, but I am going to say that I do like this uh, clip very much, which is why I'm showing it here. And you guys should remember this. <laughs> So this guy is the aforementioned Chen Zixiao. Uh, Max just uh, mentioned his name. And uh, he's actually the nephew of the current uh, grandmaster, the current guardian of Chen style Tai Chi right now, Chen Xiao Wang. Uh, this guy, the one on the right, right there, in black, is his nephew. Obviously, you have to say, hey, if he's part of the original Chen family that made the style, he's got to be really good, right? This is what he looks like in action, right? This is exactly what uh, Mac and I did of the same nature, except there's actually a floor. Keep in mind that Mac was actually being very kind with me, okay? When we were doing that uh, uh, freestyle Tai Chi, 
He could have probed, and he has. He chose not to. Okay. So let's see what it looks like with that stuff. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so we'll yeah. stop right there. That video is about eight minutes, and we want to get to other things. But uh, the point is, uh, if you check out the title right here, right, it says here, Sancho. Uh, in uh, traditional Chinese martial arts, Sancho is basically the idea of, uh, it literally means free hand, or unscattered, or unbound hand. It's the idea of uh, applying Chinese martial arts techniques in a freestyle, or even a sparring environment. It can include sparring, but it's not limited to just sparring. Uh, you notice that the term sancho and uh, tui shou, this right here, tui shou means push hands in what? tai chi. Sancho is actually a concept in all Chinese martial arts styles where you learn to apply your, your ideas and your fighting applications freestyle. That's exactly what he was doing here. And the thing that I like about Chen Zixiang is that he actually proves himself. He can really, really throw it down if you ask him to. And, and actually, I like the fact that not only does he prove himself, he challenges himself. Uh, you, you saw the clip before you gave the guy the hip throw, right? He, went, he pushed the guy, and it didn't work. So like, okay, I'll try something else. He's not perfect, but he's able to prove himself, okay? It, it, it shows that he's not fake. It's not, oh, you push me, and then I push you, and I have no resistance at all. You know, that, that's a demonstration, that's not real, okay? I like the fact that he actually proves himself. So it shows that Chinese martial arts is real, it's legitimate. So that's something I appreciate about. If I ever had to choose someone that would represent Chen style Tai Chi to actually fight, it'd be this guy. Any questions? All right, so anyways, uh, that's it for our uh, Tai Chi exposition. I'd like to thank Mac for helping us out. Okay, let's give him a